Hey guys, welcome to the Journey of a Christian Dad podcast. Glad you're here. Hey, we're going to do something a little bit different today um, and and just roll with it. Normally we pray before the podcast, but today uh, Patrick Morley's with us. We'll get more into that in a minute, but uh, Patrick's going to open us in prayer today. Mm -hmm. So welcome guys. Uh, glad we're recording the prayer this time. I didn't last time. Huh. Our dearest father, uh, first of all, uh, good morning. Uh, good day to you. We, we love you, we praise you, uh, we worship you, and by assuming a posture of humility, we uh, want to give you the honor and glory that you alone are worthy to receive. Uh, thank you for, Dan, for this uh, beautiful ministry that you've given him, and pray for the men who are listening, that they would uh, walk away from this feeling like this has been a very valuable uh, investment of their time. And we ask these things in your name and for your glory and no other reason, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yep. Oh, thanks for, thanks for kicking us off. Appreciate that. Not to put any yep. pressure on you, but uh, <laughs> you, you've been in pretty big spots with lots of, uh, lots of pressure speaking in front of large groups and everything before. So thank you. It's an honor. It's yeah, an honor yeah. to be with you too. And uh, absolutely. I love what you're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Um, so just a quick little intro, um, it, rather than just read something, I'll throw a few things in and then you can interject if you like. Um, some guys may not have heard of you. Uh, I understand. How many, how many books has, or copies or whatever has Man in the Mirror sold? Man in the Mirror, uh, over 4 million. Over 4 million. So just a yeah. few, just a few. Uh, so I've been involved in a book study uh, with Man in the Mirror. A couple of different times have done it twice now read it probably i don't know 15 times 20 times so uh it's a book that i go back and reference quite wow. often yeah yeah so so guys <laughs> that book's a really really good book and this new book uh that that uh, patrick's written is called uh broken boy from broken boy to mended man really 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 cool title um so Patrick, from uh, the books I've read in the past, real successful guy, uh, business-wise, uh, starting off, did what a lot of us do, try to conquer the world, and then uh, maybe had his idols in the wrong places, like some of us guys do. And then the world sort of crumbled around him a little bit and shook him a little bit, and then he realized there's a much, much better way, and he's radically changed his life. Uh, however... The examples he uses in his book are things that all of us guys can relate to. Is that a fairly okay-ish summary, Patrick? I love it. It's perfect. It's great. <laughs> yeah. So without jumping into all the details, and, and we can go where it goes, but um, guys, Patrick's somebody that you can absolutely relate to. Uh, he's not uh, 30 years old anymore, so you might think, you know, what am I going to learn from grandpa? Uh Guys, if you've got that mindset, you've heard me talk about it before. We can learn from the people that came before us. Some people I talk to say you stand on the shoulders of giants by being around them, by reading their books, by studying, by practicing, by teaching. So, so thankful to have you with us. And this book, holy cow, like you, in my opinion, have vulnerably shared some things in the past in your other books. Uh, however, haven't got into, you know, tons of details and stuff. However, in this book, my first question was, how in the heck are you going to uh, be vulnerable and also honor your parents without, uh, you know? Throwing them totally, under the bus. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, in the book, you talk about that, which I'm like, oh, it's so good. You just jumped right in. But what are your thoughts on that now as, you, as the book's been published or... By the way, it comes out like right away. It's not quite out yet. So thank you for the advanced copy. Yes, yes, yeah. March 19 is the update. Well, it, it's interesting because um, I did not know how much my childhood wounds uh, were affecting me. Uh, in the book, I call this emotional amnesia. Some of our, some of the guys listening right now might relate, but uh, 
yeah, as a young man, I was uh, extremely angry. I would, I was basically walking around ready to erupt at the slightest provocation. Now, I never did that at, at work because at work, uh, your reputation is on the line and who knows, maybe even your employment itself. So I was always pretty cool there, but then I'd just bottle it up, bring it home. And then something would happen uh, and my wife or one of my children would uh, do something that irritated me. And then I would uh, respond way out of proportion to what was going on. So there was that, and then I would feel bad about it. And then I get moody and pout and have a pity party. And, you know, just, and so I was having these dramatic mood swings and didn't know why, and didn't know why. And then I had other things going on too. I mean, just between like you and I right now, I, I love talking to you and feel good about that. And I am healed of all these things, but uh, one of the principal characteristics of broken boys, and I put mine characteristics of broken boys in the book. The first one is, is that you have a hard time believing that people really care about you. So you walk into a room and, you know, you're just suspicious. You don't really, and Eric Erickson's very, the great psychologist who developed a, uh, one of the premier child development theories. He says that, you know, the first task of a child is trust versus mistrust. And so uh, when a little boy is not the gleam in his mother's eye is not the pride of his daddy then he makes a decision that the world's not a safe place and so these things can follow you all through your life so um if you're listening you know you might think well i'm not i'm not sure what we're talking about here yet but what i'm say, going to tell you is that when i was 53 years of age 53 years of age, my uh, mother died and I didn't feel anything. I wasn't sad, didn't miss her, I didn't cry. And I thought that was pretty strange. So I made an appointment with a counselor who over eight sessions really helped me put into words the, uh, the father and mother wounds that I'd never been able to articulate. Okay, now let's go from 53 years of age all the way back uh, so I quit high school in the middle of my senior year. My next brother followed in my footsteps. He eventually died of a heroin overdose. And my uh, two youngest brothers have had way more than their fair share of uh, problems uh, over the years. And my dad never saw that coming. Now, go back even further than that. My dad was abandoned by his dad when my dad was two years of age, the youngest of four kids. So my father, uh, I, I, I think I'm pretty sure he wanted to do the right thing. I know he did, mm -hmm. but he had never felt the scratch of his father's whiskers. He'd never heard his father's soothing voice, reading him a bedtime story. He'd never tossed a ball in the backyard, never wrestled with his dad on the living room floor, never had his hair tussled and, and so on. And so what normal male behavior looked like was unexampled to him. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think my dad, I know my dad wanted to break the cycle. They didn't talk like that back then. I know he wanted to break the cycle, but it didn't work out for him because he never had any guys like you, Dan, take him mm -hmm. under uh, his wing, their wing, and teach him, show him, disciple him, mentor him uh, how to be a godly man, husband, and father. So, um, so I left. I left. You know, I left it, and I joined the army. Uh, Dad wasn't going to let me hang around the house, but I quit high school. Uh, funny side story. Well, not funny, but a side, interesting side story. My dad uh, was planning, had a had an appointment to get his glasses, uh, the prescription in his glasses changed because he was having these headaches. Uh, but then after he dropped me off at the enlistment office, his headaches went away and he didn't need to get glasses anymore. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. 
So I was pretty out of control kid. Um, so if you're listening and uh, <clears throat> you, if you were able to say <clears throat> that my dad uh, and my mom, my parents uh, were encouraging or my parents were affirming, then you probably grew up under positive parenting. But what if you can't say that? What if you say one or more of seven different things? And these are seven different things in the book where I spent about a page or page and a half on each of these just to help men understand what we're talking about here. What if you say my parents were passive? My par parents were absent, maybe by divorce, death, mental illness, addiction, whatever. Number three, my parents were permissive. Uh, I got away with almost anything but murder. Or my parents were enabling. They did not require me to do the things that I could and should do for myself or hold me accountable when I did something that I shouldn't do. My parents were angry. I, I had to always walk around on eggshells and I never knew what was going to set them off. My parents were demanding. Uh, I have a, a guy working on it, just put a fence in and I gave him a copy, an advanced copy of this book. And he said, uh, he said, yeah, that this, this is, this is what my parents were. They were demanding. It felt like my, my growing up experience was like living in Auschwitz, you mm -hmm. know? The, so he, he just strict, very strict, very demanding, no affirmation. And then the final one would be my parents were belittling. They're actively making jokes at your expense. Uh, one of my best friends for 17 years, a guy named Jim, when he was a little boy, he had his friend Timmy over. And one day, Jim's dad, my friend's dad, uh, was at the door when Timmy needed to go home for dinner. And he opened the door for Timmy. And with his son standing right there, he said to Timmy, he said, Timmy, you can come back anytime. I sure wish I had a son like you. Mm. he never got over it i mean he literally never mm. ever got over that i think eventually we we he and i walked work work through that i think he forgave his father but the damage was done you know and of course it was the tip of the iceberg too but belittling remarks so guys uh you know if you would say one of those seven things about your parents and then on top of that you you find yourself lashing out or withdrawing or blowing up relationships or sabotaging your career and you don't really understand what's going on there's a good chance that you may have some unresolved childhood wounds and that's what this book is about and this book is really not about me i i do tell my story to be the frame so that guys would be able to follow along the whole arc of the of the book but it's really about you and uh, what's going on in your life and uh, uh, what God wants to do in, in, in your life. So that's, that's where I'm coming from in this book. <laughs> that was fantastic. So as I was um, kind of journeying through the book, cause it, it really is kind of a journey yeah. and things I thought about were, uh, you know, how you're going to speak about your parents, uh, your childhood, speak about your kids, speak about your wife, speak about, your own role or the questions you're going to ask. So this book has got questions during the chapters and after the chapters, which allow you to reflect and think. And as I'm listening to the stories and questions, I kept thinking to myself in multifaceted um, approaches. Uh, and what I mean by that is, okay, how, how did I grow up? How did my parents treat me in these different ways? Uh, mm -hmm. Thankfully, you know, I guess I'm on the 20% on the positive parenting side of things. My dad once asked me, he says, uh, you know, sure I let you down in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I messed up quite a bit and, you know, he had his ways about him that he learned from his father and learned what not to do from his father. Um, but I said, dad, man, there was that one time where you didn't build me that Johnny bench batter up so I could be in the major leagues. Like <laughs> that was the thing. Like <laughs> I go, and dad, if, if that's the worst thing that you did, man, <laughs> you did okay, man. You you, you cleared beautiful. the bar. You did you cleared the bar. You know, there were there were 
other things as well, but you know, of like looking back to my childhood, that was a thing. But um, yeah, I, th I thought through, you know, the interactions, you know, my parents had with me and how they grew up and um, just how, the, how the generational side of things works and, and where God was working throughout those relationships. And then I took that and thought, well, how, how do I use these questions, these thoughts in my marriage? Hmm. So am I a passive husband? And if so, where, or if not, you know, how am I doing there? What's, where could I grow in that area? Am I an absent husband? Maybe physically in the home, maybe around, but focus so much on the kids and not paying attention to my wife. Am I a permissive husband? And I, I just gave a speech the other day at the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference, which was a happy wife, happy life. And the big lie drives me crazy when, uh, when I hear the happy wife, happy life, you know, go do that, go do that. You'll have a great marriage. You'll have a great family. Like everything will be great. And I'm like, I looked in the Bible and I never found anything that related to that. Um, and then aside from that, there's the yes, dear, whatever you want. Yes, honey, whatever you want. Like, hmm, <clears throat> sounds like permissive <clears throat> husband. Am I an angry husband? You mentioned not being angry at work, but a lot of guys can be good with their kids, but angry at their wife. You know, just uh, just the other day, I thought of an example, and I'm like, why why did I instantly go to dang it, my wife, as opposed to look back at me and what did I do to contribute to the situation? So, you know, cast the first stone kind of thing. Am I a demanding husband, an enabling husband, a belittling husband? Uh, not so much me, but I see that mm -hmm. around in the world. And I think to myself, hey, man, you know, let's go to lunch. Let's go have a coffee. I'd love to talk to you and see what you're thinking. You know, mm -hmm. can't open the conversation that way, but, you know, you, you want to invite them in and spend some time with them. And then at the same time, you know, how are you taking these same questions and applying them with your kids? Like, how are you doing in these areas as a parent? And then in the friend relationships and male relationships that you have, how are you relating to others and how are you taking information like this and bringing this into real life? And, and in, in my way, you know, not my way, I think God's way using examples like this is, is, is all of our missions. So if there's one thing in our lives that we want to do, I want to do, I want to get to heaven, you know, love Jesus, have him bring me to heaven. And with that, I want everybody else to go there as well. So I think things like this in this book and by sharing it with others and loving others intentionally, this is a way that we can help others get to heaven and impact generations. So those are my thoughts as I was reading the book, Patrick. Mm, that's good. That's beautiful. Yeah. So <clears throat> the arc of the book <clears throat> is <clears throat> it's broken into three parts. Uh, part one is uh, unraveling what happened to you or understanding what happened to you. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a, a person who usually write, I want to write about solutions and, and the positive pieces, right? So, so guys, that's another thing about this book. <laughs> Patrick is a solutions guy. He's a solutions guy. So like, if you ever think like a guy and you want to solve things and fix things, and then he, I think goes backwards and adds a little color to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> if you, if you're trying to solve the wrong problem, you can only succeed by accident. So <clears throat> we do need to take the time to understand what happened to you uh, as a child. What, what your parents were like, we talked about that. Parenting is this uh, sacred privilege and, and responsibility of putting together a, the right cocktail of love, structure, roots, and wings. And when, uh, a parent, when parents do that, then their children will say, my parents were affirming or encouraging. When parents get part of that wrong or one or more parts of that wrong, that's when we have these other seven situations. The problem, of course, is that that <clears throat> then results in impacts on the child. And 
Alcoholics uh, Anonymous, they have their list of characteristics. Um, Al-Anon, Adult Children of Alcoholics, they have their list of characteristics. So I felt like um, those of us who are in the fraternal order, Broken Boys, we needed to have our list, our own list. So <clears throat> over a period of years, I developed these, these nine characteristics of Broken Boys and put them in the book. I've mentioned a couple you know, dramatic mood swings. I don't know why nine of them altogether. And so really by the end of the first section of the book, I do believe men are going to have new knowledge about what happened to them. And it's going to be eye opening uh, as it was to me. I spent a uh, sidebar. I, I did spend six years trying to decide whether or not I should even write this book <laughs> because, you know, I didn't want to throw my parents under the bus. Uh, and I had to sort of noodle out in my brain how I could write this book in a way that what I wanted to do is I wanted to write the book in a way that all three of us could sit down in a room and go over the manuscript and say, yes, that's what really happened. And yes, we, we, we think that that could be something that might be able to help somebody else. So my parents were nice people. They really were. Uh, they were extremely passive and very permissive. When I was dating my wife, she said, you know, your parents gave you too much say, and they really did. Uh, and then just, I never heard the words growing up, Dan, I never heard the words, I love you. I'm proud of you. We believe in you. Uh, here's some things you might want to know about the opposite sex. Uh, here's some things you might want to consider about future education. Here are the kinds of jobs you might be, you know, interested in. None of that. None of that. We weren't a a physically affectionate family either. I, I have no recollection of, of ever being hugged. Now, I'm not naive. I, I'm not here to say none of those things ever happen. But even if they did, it it's still very significant at my age that I still have no recollection of those things. I'll give you an example. So <clears throat> when I was writing the book, I remembered something. Uh, my, I, I raced motocross in college, and my parents apparently didn't come to events, but she, they, they did come to one motocross race. Hmm. Well, that happened to be the race that I had a bad crash and got flown to the hospital in a helicopter, right? Oh, man. <laughs> so uh, I'm 75 years of age, and it was. And it was not until last year when I was writing the book that you you would think that, okay, so my parents, they didn't come to the emergency room wow. and, they, and they didn't call to see how I was doing. Well, you would think that that would be s such a horrible experience that I, it would have just completely devastated my life, right? Well, here's the thing. I didn't even remember it until last year. Oh, my gosh. So the, the, the power of denial is s s off the charts. It, it, I, I call it emotional amnesia. So we all compartmentalize bad experiences and so forth. And sometimes they eat away at us and sometimes we can you know, move on. But <clears throat> emotional amnesia is something, denial is something different. It's actually emotional amnesia. You literally can't remember it. And so a number of men that I've been dealing with and with the advanced copies of the book, I um, offered the book to uh, pastors, uh, an advanced reading copy of the book, to pastors, mental health professionals, and men's ministry leaders. And so uh, some of the feedback has been phenomenal, but denial has been one of the huge areas where guys say, you know, I think I've just been in denial my whole life about what happened to me as a child. I'm going to help you walk through that and understand what happened to you if you decide to, to, to take a look. And at you this. did that yourself. Yeah, the, yeah. The counselor was working with you at 53 and you're like, no, no, I had great parents. Or oh. some version of the counselor's digging at you a little bit and you're, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I made a total defense. I mean, talk about... Uh, you know, being a good attorney, I, I would have been a good attorney. I, the, I put up a great defense for my parents. 
Um, but she kept pressing in, leaning in. And eventually I did face the truth and I did get out of denial. And the thing that comes after now, and then now the second part of the book is, is the process of healing your childhood wounds. So there's a, uh, a process, a biblical process for healing childhood wounds that has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. Improvements, uh, uh, refinements are made, you know, by different psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors and so forth. But there's also some sense, we all know that there's nothing new under the sun. So the basic core elements of this process remain unchanged. And the first one is to get out of denial and to face the truth. And uh, But then after that comes grieving what could and should have been. And uh, so there will be a, a couple of places if you... So I need to say at this point too, as a sidebar, <clears throat> most of my books, I when I do a, a podcast or an interview like this, Dan, I know that very few people are actually going to go out and buy the book. So what I try to do is I try to give them enough of the book in the podcast that they, at least they have the main ideas. Yeah, yeah. This, this is not that book. Uh, <laughs> you, this, What we're talking about here, uh, the, the subtitle, A Positive Plan to Break the Cycle, heal, heal your, A Positive Plan to Heal Your Childhood Wounds and Break the Cycle. So that's not something that can just be intellectually attained and then everything's going to be okay. You and actually my thought, have guys, to go is get the all, two copies of the book. Get yourself an audible copy. Yeah. Listen to it through and get yourself the paperback copy so that you can write in it, yeah. go back to it, journal off to the side, whatever your process is. But I like yep. the audible side, the listening, and also, um, and you read this one yourself personally. No, I do not. No, no, no you don't. Okay. It's... Uh, to me, I heard your voice as I'm. I was listening to yeah, it. Yeah. I'm like, I, I was just tracking right there along with you. Where, uh, but anyway, you'll think it's Patrick reading it because <laughs> it just sounds so authentic. The the guy who who reads it is great. But um, so, so no, I, I highly encourage you to get two copies of this book. Oh, that's good. So yeah, so uh, first is you know, first part is just understanding what happened to you, and then the second part is going through this healing process and I'll, t I'll walk you through it step by step <clears throat> and uh, and then the third part of the book is breaking the cycle in your marriage with your children with your friends and other men so uh it it, it really is focused on healing and the future but you do have to take the time to understand what's going on so when i turned 24 i became a follower of jesus um, I, as I mentioned, I left, you know, I quit high school. So I was basically the best word to describe my relationship with my parents after that was estranged. And frankly, if not for my wife, I probably wouldn't have had any contact at all. I was very angry about the whole thing. Didn't know why. I was just a kid. I, how, how, how would I know? Uh, besides, it was very confusing because my parents were actually very nice people. But whether intentional or unintentional, the effect was the same. Our family was very dysfunctional. So um, I think what happened was out of ignorance, not malice, but we were dysfunctional. So when I be, uh, became a follower of Jesus at 24, <clears throat> uh, one of my brothers had... Uh, been off the, the one who had also quit high school he'd also joined the military and he'd been off fighting in a war and uh our family had not been together in a few years so when i was 25 years of age my parents uh, had us all out for thanksgiving dinner and when we grew up i grew up in a christian home that didn't know christ if that makes any sense that makes a lot of sense to a lot of guys <clears throat> so but we did we went through the motions. And so we said grace before meals. So, but our, our, uh, our method was to say as, the fewest words possible as rapidly as possible. So our prayer our for, for grace was God is good. God is great. And we thank you for this food. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> 
But at this particular Thanksgiving dinner, <clears throat> to my mom and dad and my wife and myself and my three younger brothers, we were all sitting at the table. And my dad said, uh, I'd like to pray today. And so he started out very slow. He said, Lord, Mom, and I would just like to say thank you. And then he started blubbering. Mm. And he excused himself. And he went into the bedroom. I followed him in there. I said, Dad, Dad, are you all right? What's wrong? He said, he said yeah, I'm okay. He said, just, it's just that um, your mother and I never thought that we would ever see our four boys together again. Mm. And so something softened in me that day. And uh, because I had, you know, because Christ had given me, I, I just made the decision to unilaterally forgive them. I think that Jesus teaches unilateral forgiveness. I talk about it in the book and explain yeah. why. I, should, I prove it through scripture. And, uh, <clears throat> but I didn't have this paradigm of uh, healing childhood wounds and breaking the cycle. I was just going on intuition. So um, that was 25, and I resolved things finally when I was 53. So that's 28 years, right? 28 mm -hmm. years. So guys, what I'm telling you, I think you can do in 2.8 months what took me 28 years <laughs> to do if you have the right tools to do that. Abraham Maslow said, uh, if the only tool that you have is a hammer, you tend to think of every problem as a nail. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. You have to have the right tools. This is a tool to help you. It's a positive plan. It's a plan to help you heal your childhood wounds and break the cycle. And uh, with these three different distinct parts in it, I really think that... Um, yeah, I just noticed it today, this morning, it's the uh, number one new men's, uh, n number one new release in Christian men's issues. So it's uh, on pre-order. So a lot of guys are already connecting with the, the dots that this is something that might be useful to them. And so I really want to encourage your listeners to, to get a copy of the book. Uh, women, if you're listening, uh, what I want to say to you is, yes. Uh, get the book or you can read it for yourself. But beyond that, uh, if you want to understand your husband better, if your husband is volatile and, and you don't know what to expect and he, and uh, he's insecure and he's constant reassur reassurance or uh, if he's maybe like, especially immature for his age, or maybe he's like over responsible, you know, he's very demanding, you know, there's a very good chance that he has unresolved childhood wounds. So read it, you'll understand. I mean, you want him to read it too, but here's my advice, unsolicited advice to you women. Uh, encourage him to read the book, but please don't give the book at him. Mm -hmm. Don't give it at him. You say, hey, honey, I, I heard about this book. I read, I, th I, I think you might find it useful. Just leave it at that and then pray and then pray uh, because uh, men, we're proud and we don't like yeah, people telling yeah. us what to do. And, Absolutely. and we especially don't like our our wives telling us what to do. And uh, and and women, guys, uh, back and forth. As I was reading this book, also, I thought, you know, so many of these uh, things that came up are also women's issues as well. Yes. So, you know, women also have the they weren't parented well. They they weren't in a positive parented household, and so on and so forth. But uh, some of these things are unique to men, but quite a few are, you know, just people in general. So. Uh, women read this one, you know, the same way that I did, you know, apply these principles all around and look at yourself as well and see where you can heal. Also, um, something you mentioned, uh, love, believe and proud. And a friend of mine, Blake Brewer, he's got a legacy letter writing challenge course where he teaches dads and moms how to write a letter to your kids and his three core things that he puts in it are love, believe and proud, mm -hmm. just like in the Bible. Just yeah. like Jesus's father spoke about him when he got baptized. Yeah. I'm like, what a, what a cool principle. And he talks about apologizing to your kids and owning up to the things that, you know, you missed the mark on. 
you know, yeah, you I put the full the best you could I, at the I time. I put the actual full letter, uh, unedited letter that I sent to our children. Uh, I was teaching one time on uh, on uh, anger, and uh, in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, it talks about uh, us having an angry spirit, and a, the the concept of a of a spirit of anger, having an sp angry spirit really clicked with me and I realized that I had an angry spirit. That was my, that was my basic, that was my baseline. Uh, I was, and, and I didn't know why at the time, but when, once that, you know, I got, got on that one. And by the way, all these things that I did discovered atomistically, I've now systematized that, you know, I've got a PhD, I'm a systems theory guy. <laughs> I have taxonomies for everything. You know, this Dan, I'm yes, very internal. Yes. So I've, I've put this all together into a cohesive process. All these things that I learned, I learned a little thing over here and a little thing over there, but I've been able to now to pull it all together. And, and my counselor was a big help in that uh, too, of course. So, uh, yeah, so I, I would just really, yeah. Enough said. <laughs> you, you share a funny story in the book where your mom is talking to you in front of your kids, or at least some of your kids, and says something along the lines of, you know, kind of missed the mark on telling you I loved you, you know, when you were younger. Oh, and, no. You know. I, yeah, it's a great story. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So our, our my mom and dad, you know, we live in the same city. They never invited our, our children to do a sleepover or anything like that. They just uninvolved, you know. Uh, I don't know why, but anyway, they weren't. And but so, and they didn't come to our children's events. But we did finally get them to come to one of our son's basketball games. He was point guard in high school, uh, and uh, and so in the eleventh grade, he was point guard. And he's playing, and and uh, my mom and dad came, and so I was sitting on the aisle. My mom was next to me, my dad was next to her, and then my wife was on the far end. So we were the bread and they were the, the meat and the sandwich. And so I was sitting next to my mom and I said, you know, we're just so proud of John. We tell him every day we love him and we're proud of him. And he's so industrious and we're so proud of all the diligence and leadership skills and different things that he's learning, the perseverance and determination of being in sports, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we just tell him every day that we're, we're, we're how proud we are of him. And then my mom, she's like sitting right next to me, right? Right, right there. And she says, to no one in particular, she says, you know, she's looking out, out into the air, you know, she's looking up out into thin air. And she says, you know, when our four boys were growing up, I don't think we told them often enough that we were proud of them. And I wanted to, I wanted to scream, mom, I'm right here. I'm one of those four boys. Why are you talking in the third person? I, I'm right here. And then another voice said, it was screaming also mom it's not too late you can tell me now you can tell me now but of course i didn't say anything at all i just sat there this was all going on in my head and so uh we had already crossed the threshold of love uh when i was um so it's a funny story before we get, go into that yeah. Blake was talking with Terry Bradshaw, Blake Brewer, Legacy Letter Challenge. Him and Terry have gotten to know each other over the years. His dad was really good friends with Terry. And Terry says, you know, my dad never told me he loved me all my life. And then after his, you know, pro Hall of Fame football career, he buys a ranch and his dad's a rancher. So they start connecting at the ranch. And Terry says to his dad, and Terry's outspoken, says what he thinks. And he says, dad, you never told me, you know, you love me all throughout, you know, everything. He says, I know you love me. I know you do, but you've never told me. He goes, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and that was Dad, it. <laughs> I'm right here. Will you tell me you love me? And he says, wow. you know I do, son. He says, but I'm here, Dad. Right now I'm like dying. Will you tell me you love me? So even after all the years of, you know, yeah. At 52, 50, 53, uh, I don't know if it was, I think it was Dr. James Dobson. You mentioned him uh, earlier when we were talking and he wins his lifetime achievement award. And they said, what do you got to say in front of this huge crowd? And he says, I wish my dad was here because if he was here, I, I bet he'd be proud. It's like yeah. Yeah. after a lifetime of achievement of doing amazing things, you're still seeking your dad's approval. And is my dad proud? 
So yeah. maybe he heard it a million times. Maybe he didn't. But yeah. so hearing you say it, and then as men, we don't ask our parents if we're, we were missing something. Hey, we just tell like, she was right there next to you. And you said, I didn't ask her. <laughs> so there may be some men listening today uh, and women too. You mentioned women and uh, I give, I want to give women permission to read the book. I'm a men's author, right? So I write books for men and I want to stay in my lane, but I did have a, a, a woman, a female counselor write yesterday. She wanted to know if, if, if this book, she could read the book for herself. And uh, I said, absolutely. Um, yeah. So but some of, some of you might not be able to identify with having passive or permissive parents. Maybe, I mean, you might have had abusive parents. They were, they might have been physically abusive, emotionally abusive, abusive, sexually abusive. They might have been uh, neglectful, not taking care of your basic human needs. Uh, they might have been toxic. Who knows? Your your parents might even have been evil. But I'm I, what I want you to understand is no matter where your parents are on the continuum. The biblical process for healing your childhood wounds and breaking the cycle is the same. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to be more challenging for you. Uh, I have the, the, one of the worst things I've ever heard is one of my friends. Um, I don't even know if I should say this, but I, I, I will go ahead and say it anyway. His father was a trucker. And when he would when his dad would come home, he would hide in the cabinets underneath the kitchen sink because he knew that when his dad found him, he was going to sexually abuse him mm. when he came off the road. Well, you just don't get, you, you know, you just, you never really fully get by, by that. But I will say this, my friend through the, the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy of Jesus has been able to, eventually conquer that now he had a long hard process to go through to get there but so you're thinking well you don't know my parents <laughs> they're the last people in the world that i would want to forgive but i'm i'm here to suggest to you that uh, forgiveness is not about them uh, forgiving them is is not about them. Forgiving them heals you. Forgiving your parents heals you. And I'm going to show you how you can do that unilaterally, even if they're evil, even if they're toxic, even if they're not alive, even if they're just terrible people, or if they're on the other end of the spectrum like mine, the process is really the same. And I'm going to show you how to do that in the book. Daryl Strawberry think... shares a story like that. The baseball player, he says, my dad when he was 12, came into the household with a shotgun and said, I'm going to shoot you all up. Wow. And mom, mom got him out, saved him. And then he didn't um, associate with his dad ever again, just cut him out of his life. And God told Daryl, go, go to your father. You're hours away. Go to your father. He's close to death. Ask your father for his forgiveness. And he mm -hmm. says, God, I ain't doing that. And you're wrong. I need to go to him and tell him he needs to forgive me. Right. And God's like, Daryl, you heard me correctly. Go do what I told you to do. Go ask for your father's forgiveness for, for the things you've done to your father. Mm -hmm. And he broke down, cried, surrendered, went, left his father. He said, I felt so free. I felt so forgiven, but it was the last thing in the world I ever wanted to do right. no matter what. And instead I didn't tell my father he needs, I didn't ask for him to, you know, seek my forgiveness because I, yeah. I forgave my father for ask my father to forgive me, even though the father clearly caused. And yeah. he's like, it was amazing. He goes, God, God, God knows what he's doing. Listen to him. Mm. Whatever wounds you have, man, they may describe you, but they do not have to define you. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I'm on childhood wounds, that's for sure. And you're hearing several stories here even now about how that works. So my uh, uh, father, uh, I uh, really wanted to reconnect with him. Uh, so 
I forgave my parents at 25, but it was still Christmas, Easter and Labor Day picnic, you know. But in my early 30s, I, I really started to, I just call it, have a, a yearning to reconnect and reconcile, have a relationship with my with my dad in particular. So I invited him to go to lunch on his birthday, and we had a great time. He said yes, and we had a great time. We made that an annual tradition. When I was 35 years of age, we finished our lunch and we're walking out to our vehicles and they happened to be parked next to each other. Uh, my dad had a truck. He was a working man and I, my car was next to his. And Dan, I, I really have no idea what, where this came from or how it happened. But I said, Dad, uh, could I give you a hug as we were getting ready to go to our cars? And before the words were out of my mouth, he was charging me like a grizzly bear. <laughs> and he he wrapped his arms around me and he just let out this deep primordial groan. <clears throat> Must have lasted for 20 seconds. And we drew back from each other, hands on each other's shoulders. Tears were streaming down our faces. And I said, I love you, Dad. And he said, I love you too, son. Mm. And that was the first time I ever recall hearing the words, I love you. I was 35 years of age. It was magic. It was electric. It completely transformed not just me, not just my, our relationship, but our entire family. Dan, mm. it was crazy. It's, I never spoke of it to anybody in the family. And I'm almost certain my dad never spoke of it, <laughs> but our our entire family, the the whole tenor texture tone of our family changed. So it was just a few months later. I was talking to my younger brother, uh, one of my younger brothers on the phone. He said we we finished, and uh, he said, "Well, uh, I said, well, you know, I I love you." And he said, "Well, no, no, I got that backwards." He said, "I love you," and I said, "Well." I love you more than you love me. He said, no, 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 no. I love you more than you love me. And I said, no, you don't. I've loved you more than you love me for a long time. And then I laughed and hung up the phone on him. <laughs> and I was thinking, who, who are you? And what have you done with my brother? You know? Um, but it just, it, it, it was a beautiful thing. Now that may not happen in every situation. So in the book, I do, do show you how to have Awkward conversations with your parents, siblings, whomever, how to have awkward conversations, and then also how to set up boundaries. So, for example, if you have, if your parents come over to your home and put your wife down and say uh, demeaning things, belittling things to your children, I'm going to show you how to set up boundaries for that. Uh, but even in the context of that, I'm also going to show you how you can you don't have to be the prisoner of those behaviors. Yeah. I love, uh, love how the things that are in the book go right back to biblical principles. Um, yep. I've got a, uh, uh, one of, one of the listeners, he says, I want to ask him if he could sit down now as an adult with himself as a child, what would he say to that child sitting across from him? Yeah. It's, I, I love you. Uh, I'm proud of you. I believe in you. Uh, this is right out of, you mentioned the baptism of Jesus, also at the transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. My beloved son, I love him, in, who yes. I, in whom I am well pleased. I'm proud of him. I love you. I'm proud of you every day. I, I just encourage fathers every single day, tell each child every day, I love you. I'm proud of you. I believe in you. I'm here for you. And then if they're grown, uh, pick up the phone right now. Don't even text them. Pick up the phone or text them and ask them if it's okay for a phone call. But tell them verbally, I love you and I'm proud of you. I actually have a daily relationship with my grown son. And uh, every day I tell our son still that I love him. It's, it's magic. It releases 
it releases all the, the, the fruits of the spirit in the child. It releases the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in the child. So yeah, that's my, that's my advice. And there's, even if parents were great, uh, you know, you, you may navigated things as kids and as adults, we tell ourselves stories <laughs> that might not serve us. So I think this book also can help us process through those stories and realize where we came up with them. Um, I think it was your story where, no, it was that pastor's, pastor's son, the bike, the bike, trip yeah, Noah. And, or, mm -hmm. uh, the ba uh, baseball game. He, he... So the bike story is mine. And then the, the counselor threw out another story. So yeah, this is probably the signature story or at least a signature story of my childhood. So when I was uh, about 10 years of age, I had a little little league baseball game. I was putting on my uniform and my parents apparently didn't come to the games. And so they said that announced that they would like to, that they were planning to come to the game. Well, I, I argued with them until I was in tears that I didn't want them to come to the game. And finally they relented and said, okay, well, okay, okay. We, we won't come to your game then. Then I threaded the um, baseball glove over my handlebars and cried for the eight minute bicycle ride all the way to the Little Lake Field because they were not coming. I mean, so my counselor says, well, what do you think that means? I said, well, <laughs> you tell me, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I have no idea what it means. And then she told the story about a pastor who had a son named Noah and he promised his son Noah that he would take him fishing the next morning. The little boy was bounding around the house so excited the, the night before. Next morning, they were getting ready and the phone rang. Pastor answered the phone. He said, yes, yes, I understand. I'll be right there. Put down the phone and rushed out of the house. That evening when he got home, his little boy Noah, who had been bounding around the house earlier, was now moping over his dinner Pastor's wife said, do you know that you had promised to take Noah fishing this morning? And he was mortified. He said, Noah, I can't believe I, I did that. I am so sorry. Uh, please forgive me and, and, and we'll go fishing another time. Noah said, that's okay. I don't like fishing anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to my counselor, I think I'm starting to get the picture. And the point is, is that a little boy cannot handle the thought, cannot brook the idea, cannot live with the 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 the, 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 the possibility that his father doesn't want to be with him. So instead, he substitutes, "I don't like fishing." <laughs> so she said, "When you told your parents that you didn't want them at your game." What do you think was happening? I said, I think I'm getting the picture now. And so net-net of that, um, I made a decision, apparently, at 10 years of age, that if my parents, uh, a vow, really, if my parents, sometime before 10, if my parents don't want me, then I don't want them either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, so that uh, story is rooted, rooted in, in childhood and parenting. And, um, yeah. But at the same time, these stories that we just put into ourselves, we make them up. Yeah. Are they serving us? Or are they not serving us? So whether it's parenting or whether it's just something that comes along the way, uh, so many people are like stuck in a, in a, in the wrong lane, in a rut, in a, a bad, bad pattern of thinking. And I think you mentioned it also that the devil plants these thoughts, misdirects our thoughts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, well, here's the problem when, with we, the when we wonder where this stuff comes from, we don't have to wonder all that much. In in large part, the devil's got him and his minions planting these and, and misdirecting us. I think it's also important to understand that uh, if my vow is my vow and other men might have their vows, but it we don't just apply that to our parents. We That becomes part of the narrative of our life. And yes. so, uh, you know, Okay, well, if you're not going to give me what I need, then I'm done with you. And this, uh, we ghost each other way too quickly. We don't take the time to really understand the other person. We don't uh, because we we feel that they're they're a threat to our self confidence, to our well being, and so we just say, okay, well, 
done with you. And that, so uh, the whole idea of the book is to really help men bubble these ideas up, be able to grasp them and understand them, unravel what happened to them. And then, but of course, positively, you know, then to, to go through this healing process and then break the cycle for their own families. So funny thing just happened as men, as husbands, we can get angry at our wives, like snap your fingers. And my wife is going up to church to serve. She knows I'm, you know, recording a podcast. Well, she opens the door, blows me a kiss. So go back 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I could have got angry about that. What are you doing interrupting me about? She's sharing her love for me. Like, and she's going to serve at church. Like, fantastic. Come on in, you know, interrupt the whole thing. No big deal. Like, Absolutely. And then who am I trying to impress? Yeah. <laughs> she's the most important person on earth for me. And she's going to, mm-hmm. you know, serve the church community. And, you know, that I'm going to get angry. Nah, uh, we had a guy called it removing the root cause of bitterness. So when you find yourself snap into anger towards someone or something figure out what that is and yeah patrick talks about going into healing and uh discovering like uh oh, this book is so so helpful to help you navigate those things in a in a way that is not um uh, uh it's like a friend you know it's like a friend guiding you through and just being being with you on the journey and you also mentioned uh, doing like book clubs with this. So I would encourage that as well to have other guys join you and, uh, and progress through this. And that'll help you develop strong male friendships that don't just talk about the weather and sports and how your kids doing on the field or whatever. Like yeah. this, this book can really help you grow bonds with other, other guys in your community or online guys, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, I think this one is a great, book club type book that's really more of a book journey and life-changing event Mm. yeah all all of my books are uh, designed so they can be done in groups Uh, they (laughs) already done two of your groups your books in groups (laughs) yeah yeah so there's a discussion uh leader's guide at the back if so if you wanted to start a group and it maybe had not done that before there's a, a leader's guide in the back there are reflection and discussion questions at the end of each chapter. And so the idea is just uh, for each man to, to read a chapter and then to come together as a group and discuss the questions. The questions uh, do not do not violate the process of relationships. So in other words, I'm not asking men to air things in, in the group that they wouldn't be ready to talk about. And so that's important. There are also reflection questions in the in, in in the chapters themselves to really help you think through and process, uh, you know, what what happened uh, in your particular situation. So, for example, those nine characteristics that I mentioned uh, at the uh, you know one of them is uh, characteristic number four. You're not sure what healthy male behavior looks like, and then at the end of the two pages there's a reflection exercise and it says how often do you feel you know what healthy male behavior is in a given situation so this is just for you the reader and then there's a continuum and earlier in the book i encourage men to 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 read the book with a a pen or a highlighter and uh if they want to and so you could highlight one of these one of these words on the continuum So how often do you feel like you know what healthy male behavior is in a given situation? Never. I never know what healthy male behavior looks like. Rarely, sometimes, usually, always. And uh, so uh, I talk about my, I tell a story about when I was in the army, I, uh, I rose to specialist four in the minimum amount of time and then uh when my master sergeant did promote me to sergeant e5 in the minimum amount of time i started pestering him so he sat me down one day and he said son let me give you some advice the more you pester me the less motivated i am to promote you and uh, just very awkward start and my situation i'm reading now from the book my situational awareness 
was virtually non-existent, didn't have good boundaries, emotional intelligence was stunted, I floundered. No one had taken me under their wing and mentored me about what it looks like to be a man. Can you relate, guys? For, you know, so, um, uh, yeah, and so forth and so on. Some of the characteristics you feel socially awkward and insecure. You sabotage your relationships and your career. You can be intense, coming on too strong around others. You can say things that should be left unsaid. You make people uncomfortable and you don't know why. You are fragile, but, but afraid to appear weak by asking for help. You find it difficult to rise above your circumstances. You want to be steady like a thermostat, not up and down like a thermometer, but you don't know how to set the thermostat and so on and so forth. So I have little descriptions like that for each of these nine characteristics so that men can uh, self-identify where appropriate. I love the the words that you tied to it. Uh, you guys may find these words also in the Bible, but how often do you exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, humility, which I love, integrity, gratitude, and wisdom. Yeah. Like what what uh, what makes a great authentic man? Uh, I think that's a pretty good summary list. Like if you can do those things often, that's a pretty good list. Yeah. And the thing is, is that those are fruit of the Holy Spirit. So this is not about performance. You, you and your own power and strength, ginning up the ability, you know, to get amped up, ramped up, jacked up so that you can do these things in your own strength. Um, that's a recipe for burnout. But what what I'm doing in the book is I'm showing you how you can receive Jesus and and walk in the power of his spirit and exhibit these fruit of the spirit and really be fully alive in Jesus uh, so that you're not walking around feeling like, okay, well, I, I need I need to do this. I need to do that. Uh, no, you, you need to be sur surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus and then out of the overflow of your growing relationship with him, uh, watch these things begin to change right before your eyes. Doesn't mean we don't participate. Doesn't mean we don't consecrate ourselves to it. Doesn't mean we don't have personal responsibility. But we're not trying to, to make God happy or avoid his wrath. Rather, we're responding in gratitude and self-discipline to what God is showing us to do because of his great love with which he has loved us. I had another listener, they asked, uh, can you ask him what we should share with our kids as they're looking for a spouse? I'm like, yeah. that's an interesting question. I'd like to hear your answer. So it's complex. It's, com it's a complicated question, right? But it's also, there's some simple things uh, about it. Um, I would say that after being married for, for 50 years, which I have been, my wife and I are extremely compatible. We share values. Uh, we share several common interests. Now, our typically the first and second interest for a man and a woman might be different. But when you get down to items number three and four, we have some shared interests. We we both enjoy our, we have a trailer. We go camping in that and um, together. So we sh share uh, the same faith. Uh, we, uh, even though we, I tricked my wife into thinking I was a Christian because I, right. I thought, well, I think I thought I was, but, uh, but we do share a common faith in Jesus. So compatibility, I think, is is um, very important. But here's the problem with some of these things that we might talk about is that uh, uh, young people are called upon to make, really, if you think about it, many of the, the very most important decisions that they'll ever make at an age when they're least wise uh, equipped to make them well. And so, uh, so counsel. I think advice and counsel is uh, 
one of the most important things that you can do in choosing a spouse. If 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 you have friends and uh, peers and uh, adults in your life, teachers, parents, coaches, uh, you should ask them if you what they think about the future of this relationship. Um, so compatibility, uh, getting outside counsel, I think is very important. And then uh, if it, it's not essential, but I would encourage someone to look at the parents of the person that they uh, are attracted to, because mm -hmm. if, if they're, if, if their parents if they can say of their parents, my parents were affirming, my parents were encouraging, uh, that is very powerful. It's not the end of the world if, like me, they would say my parents were passive, my parents were permissive. That's not the end of the world. But trust me, I put my wife through a lot of things that she didn't have, didn't deserve to go through because of the issues that I had to work through uh, that were unresolved from my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good list for sure. My yeah. dad gave me one years ago before I got married. He says, don't fall in love with the girl you're going to marry. Fall in love with the woman she'll become after. And my dad's not the most deep guy in the world. And I thought, pretty where good, did though. he get this from? Pretty and good. I thought, this sounds like he's onto something. I said, dad, uh, how do I do that? And he gets this grin starts chuckling and he says, good luck, son. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it took me 10, 20 years to fully grasp the, the comment and to yeah. understand the wisdom in it. And it's like, fall in love with your wife more every day. Look for ways to love and appreciate, trust, respect, admire, cherish. And as opposed to looking to criticize, condemn, be angry with her. And, uh, you know, it'll help her just bloom, blossom and, the reciprocal love will just grow from there, um, you know, and staying rooted in faith and, you know, growing towards Christ brings that marriage together so much. But uh, <laughs> I've appreciated my dad's advice more and more and more sure. all the all the years that uh, that that's stuck with me. Well, I always kid around until guys try to fall in love with a woman who loves Home Depot. <laughs> That's good also. Yeah. Um have you uh have you got any parting words of wisdom and maybe a challenge for the guys? We always like to throw a challenge out from week to week. Well, the greatest lesson that I've ever learned <clears throat> is uh one that I learned in the middle of a business crisis. So I would this would be what be I would leave as my parting comment. So I'm sitting around in the the rubble of a, a collapsing business, and uh, what, uh, it, it was my fault, you know, I made some bad decisions. Pride was involved. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just throwing it out there, guys. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the advantage of the young is they still know everything, you know, and uh, so I had the advantage of still being young enough that I knew everything, you know. So I made all these dumb decisions and. Uh, put the business at risk and it was just crumbling, crumbling, crumbling. And I'm sitting around in the rubble of all that one day and a thought goes through my mind. And as I say, I think it's the greatest lesson that I've ever learned. So I want to mention it uh, and then see if this doesn't make sense. So here was the idea. Uh, there is a God we want and there is a God who is. They are not the same God. And the turning point of our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. Does that make sense? Just that dawned is. on me one day, Morley, what were you thinking? Did, did you really think that any amount of you wanting to reinvent God in your imagination to be the God that you wanted him to be was going to have one iota of impact on his unchanging nature and character. And I realized that I've been trying to work him to get him to see things my way. And that <laughs> he was, he was wanting to, he was really wanting to shape me. I, I, and so I realized that because I am a rebel, as most men are, that I must each day come humbly to the foot of the cross. And once again, make a full complete surrender of my life to the Lordship of Jesus. 
that's the deal. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So guys, I think that's a great challenge as you go through this week, um, you know, at a minimum, take five minutes and reflect upon that. And if you can reflect on it every morning, the whole week, and just think through that. And uh, hopefully that stays with you throughout your day. And uh, you can see where you're trying to conform God to what you want, as opposed to surrender to God's will. Like that Daryl Strawberry story was so powerful when yeah. I heard it, where he's fought with God. Matter of fact, that's how this podcast started. I fought with God. God, you heard me say today, I declared I absolutely wasn't starting a podcast. And later that night I'm praying and God says, Hey, I want to talk to you about your podcast. So God, you were at that lunch. You know, I'm not doing that. He sure. says, yeah, you're right. I was there. I heard that. So anyway, <laughs> about your podcast in, in a authoritative, loving directive, this is what we're doing. Yeah. And you know, at, at that point it was up to me surrender or do it my way. I yeah. said, all right, God, I'll follow, you know, hmm. what do I do next? Hmm. And well, you know, that. he got me started. He got me started. It took a little bit of effort and energy and everything else, but you know, he kept dropping the bricks in front of me to step on. So I just kept stepping. So, hmm. and that's <laughs> wow. We're, we're talking on the podcast. Thank you for coming back a second time. And this book is awesome. Yeah. Well, the, uh, guys, if you want to take a look, you can, you can learn more about it at patrickmorley.com slash book, patrickmorley.com slash book. And there are links there to all the all the retailers. I noticed that Amazon's got it on sale right now, so that's pretty cool. And uh, I think it's you know 25% or maybe not full 25%. Anyway, it's, it's a good percentage off. But yeah, uh, take a look. And uh, I also encourage guys to read it uh, I, I, if if it's meaningful to you, read it twice for the same reason that you watch a, a good movie that you liked a second time. You know the whole arc of the movie and everything makes so much more sense the second time around. And uh, this is that kind of a book. It really is. It is a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a book to become a like a companion uh, for you, not just an intellectual exercise. Yeah, absolutely. 100% guys. And, uh, Patrick's got a podcast that came out yesterday. So <laughs> it's so good. So good. So many different, wonderful and amazing things you do, do inside of your organization and for others. So thank you for blessing us with your time and your wisdom and just sharing generously and also humbly. If, uh, if we had a live audience today, we might all stand up and give you a standing, standing ovation. Wow. Oh, that's special. That's special. My, my, I named uh, our podcast, Burn, Burn Your Boats. <clears throat> There's that great story yes. and it, it, it fits with what we're talking about here. Uh, the great story, Hernando Cortez, 1519, lands on the shore of Mexico to do his thing. And uh, he tells his men to burn their boats. Whoa, what's this? Oh, I see it is. <laughs> I got an alarm going off for another <laughs> another meeting. The uh, Yeah, so anyway, the uh, they land. He tells his men to burn their boats so that there's no possibility of turning back. That's what full surrender is. So, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. We're yeah. not doing that. Well, yeah. we don't need them anymore. We're not going back. <laughs> We're all in. So, yeah, that that was a turning right. point in that battle. So, thank you very much, Patrick. Love you, brother. Thank you guys. Love you too, Patrick. It's great to be able to uh, surrender and tell guys we love them and uh, and. Yeah. Appreciate you doing that. Appreciate the prayer before and you know, look forward to staying in touch. And maybe down the road, we even do a do a little one week or two week or three week or something book club type thing on this book. I'd love to invite guys into that. Huh. Do that and then have me come on. I'd love to I'd love to meet with them in a Zoom. Yeah. Doesn't have to be a broadcast to just be a yeah. Zoom with them. So yeah. That'd be awesome. I will. Okay, you bet. Brother. You bet. Love you, brother. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.